Thank you. Thank you. Happy faces. Lovely. Hope you enjoyed the coffee. Uh, my name is Oleg, and we're going to talk about integration tests for our uh, uh, applications. We're going to talk about the test containers libraries and how it can simplify and help you write uh, like integration tests that you love working with. Uh, right, let's get started. So I work as a developer advocate for uh, Atomic Jar, which is a small startup. Uh, made by the maintainers of the Test Containers Java uh, project, and we are building cloud services, um, and it's in the early stages, so there is not a lot of interesting things there yet, uh, but just so you know that I'm sort of involved with the Test Containers projects, and if you have questions that you don't get to ask here because we are out of time, uh, or over time, or eating into the lunch time, uh, then you can, you can find me online, which is pretty straightforward. Right, so we're gonna, we're gonna talk about tests. And I know that all of you love tests, like every developer loves tests. We know that we need to write tests. We always do, without reminders. Uh, but the, the, actually, if you think about that, this is one thing that truly we know as an industry. We do know that having better and more proper tests improves quality of software. Right, there are many things that can improve quality of software, there are many things that can improve like, happiness of developers, but, and some of them might not. Right? Like, it might be co correlation between whether you use like, Jira and your happiness, uh, might not, right? but there is a co correlation between you having good tests and the quality of the software that you produce. So tests are ans an answer to everything. Right? Can I merge this pull request? Do you have tests in it? Are they passing? Right. Uh, can I, uh, do I know if I'm working on the right thing within the certain task? Right. Am I progressing to finishing the task? Right. Well, did I write the tests? Do I have the, the tests that I still need to pass or, or not? Am I breaking other people's code who work with me in the same application uh, while I'm doing whatever my new cool development? The answer is also tests. Right? Like you run the tests and you know whether you're breaking other people's stuff. And they will know whether they're breaking your stuff. So tests are universally great. You want to have like a great shiny silky hair? The answer is personal hygiene. But tests are also good. <laughs> Lovely. Right, so better tests, more tests are almost universally a good thing. And the next session, obviously the keynote, Andrew will talk about how to write software that is maintainable. And I will be very much surprised if the answer to that is not, at least in some capacity, more and better tests. But we'll see, because I don't know. But hopefully. Right, so if you, if you, if you think about tests and what types of tests you can write and this and that, then probably you have some sort of this, like the testing pyramid mental image in your head that we, you have a ton of unit tests that are small, isolated tests, those small individual units of your code, like maybe a function or maybe like a single class or maybe just a, like a few invocation of the library methods. Um, and they, they, are, they are fast and you cover everything with them and then you're kind of sort of good to go. And then on top of that, you have more complex, more fragile, harder to maintain, kind of sort of ugly looking integration tests, which are flaky, which are fragile. That's why you have fewer of them. And they're like a high level tests, maybe going through the functional requirements of the application. If I save this data into my application, or if this the type of data passes through that, do I get the response, the correct responses back? Does my application work within the environment it's supposed to work? If I add 700 new recipes to my OpenSearch uh, cluster, can I retrieve them back through the API that my app is supposed to do? Stuff like that, integration tests. And then on top of that, there is end-to-end -end tests which are even fewer in, in, in quantity because they're even more fragile and harder to maintain, and they run in the production-like environment. So either your staging environment or like your fully replicated like a secondary cloud account environment, but it's, it's complex, it's expensive to maintain, and that's why nobody likes them, that's why there are just a few of them. That's how we did software before. 
Nowadays, it's a little bit different. Right? Nowadays, we are trying to migrate to, to, to the uh, architectures where the applications are maybe smaller, uh, maybe not so much doing all the, th all the things that uh, your code can imagine doing, but like be a single purpose things. And then they connect through various like third party services or message brokers or through databases. Uh, and that changes the utility of unit tests quite a lot. And that also highlights and emphasizes the, uh, how much you need integration tests because part of the logic of your application is how it integrates and how it works with the technologies that it needs to connect it. Does it work with the database properly? Does it send like, messages to your Kafka, right? And so on. Accidentally also, those higher level tests do check the code paths of the individual unit tests because, well, if you actually run your app, that you will cover some parts of code. So recently, many different teams individually came out with, with the idea that they don't like this testing pyramid so much as, in, as a mental model how to organize tests, and that they would like to detach from the idea that everything should be covered with unit tests, and they emphasize the amount of integration tests and make them kind of the cornerstone of the test suites. There was one article by Spotify uh, and they, they do know a little bit what they're doing uh, in the kind of sort of uh, development department. So you can check that out. There are also a number of others that you can easily find yourself. But the point is, people like integration tests more, which is very good because it fits my narrative very much. So what is an integration test, you ask? It's a test where we want to run with the actual technologies that we're gonna use in the actual real world environment but we will limit the deployment size to the immediate service dependencies of the app that we need. Imagine we are building this red square there and it depends on a bunch of other services. So what we want to do, we want to test in the environment where the green piece is present, but we don't need to actually deploy the blue one and the gray one because if we don't limit the environment, then we need to like, lift up and spin up the whole fleet of microservices, which is infeasible or super, super expensive. So you won't be doing that on your laptop, on your workstation. It will be hard to do in CI to bring up the whole thing up. And your colleagues will definitely not do that to run your tests, which is the counterproductive because we know if everyone runs tests all the time, we get better software and faster, which is great. So we're gonna, we're gonna limit to one thing, and we, if those service dependencies are off uh, the shelf software, like, I don't know, open search or uh, uh, Kafka or whatever databases that you're using, or your cloud technologies, then you will, we will use those actual services, well, not the cloud technologies, databases, say, right? Uh, off the shelf, like your Postgres or MySQL or whatnot. And if those are infeasible to, to, to run, it's like API, a third party service that you're using, then we're gonna use mocks and verify the correctness of that mocks with a separate contract test and uh, compatibility tests. But those tests will be the other people's problem, right? When we run the tests in this example for the red square, we want them to fail only when, the, when we can fix them by changing the red square, which is, uh, well, it has assumptions how the other world works, so you can run with doubles. This is kind of sort of the setup that we're gonna run, and we're gonna, of course, use Docker to run those, all the services. Why? Because it's, well, universally available. It works on all our necessary operating systems for development. Um, it's, 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 it's sort of great. Uh, and it also provides us with the universal API to run other people's software. So in the same way we can run databases, we can run message brokers, we can run everything. It gives us the way to isolate those processes so we can manage the life cycle of them uh, for our tests. It gives us the ability to configure everything, uh, impose the limits, and expose the applications and services running in containers. It's pretty great. Uh, it's, it's not superbly great for integration tests because the normal way to interact with Docker, common line, uh, or YAML files for configuration, they're not flexible enough. In the integration test, in the test, we would like to have a ton of different scenarios, a ton of different configuration. We would like to specifically put our 
application into the conditions we want to verify. What happens if one of the tests breaks my database, if it writes gibberish into some tables? What happens if my Kafka becomes unavailable because the, there's a network loss, right? Uh, it's kind of, those scenarios are very awkward to model with like the normal uh, Docker com online or like um, uh, configuration things. That's where you get the helper libraries which are, uh, will do three things. F you need three main fundamental functional blocks uh, which is illustrated with this amazing picture of three whales dancing lambada uh, by Dali. Just recently got access, so now, like, I'm, any crazy idea of what I can visualize, uh, I get a picture of that, which is great. Uh, right, so three pillars that we need. We need to manage the container lifecycle and cleanup because we want our environment to be reproducible. We never want to have like lingering like sort of Kafka somewhere, so next time I run my tests, it connects to the wrong Kafka and then everything breaks because we want reliable tests and for that we need clean, repeatable environment. We want the flexibility in the container and services within container configuration and we sort of need the integration with frameworks for our applications or with the test libraries for our tests. It's not strictly speaking necessary if we just have the API in the language, but it would be cool to have because then we don't need to do that ourselves as the application developers, right? So that's where test containers comes in. Test containers is a collection of libraries in different languages, including Python, uh, that on one end integrates with Docker as the runtime to run things, and on the other side, it offers flexible programmatic API to do exactly those things. Manage the container lifecycle, manage the configuration of things, uh, and well, since it's an API in your favorite programming language, you can use that from your tests pretty universally from your ID. It's an open source project. All of those libraries are. Uh, it's available under the Test Containers organization on GitHub. Test Containers Python is fairly old, as in like six years old, which is maybe not like super old in Python years, which is what, Python is almost 30 now. Uh, so six maybe not that long. Uh, but at the same time, uh, Docker was created eight years ago. So very, very soon after Docker became available, somebody was like, oh, I need a better flexible way to manage those containers for my tests. And in all honesty, it all started with the test containers Java. Uh, but now there are like libraries in all popular languages. There is test containers Go, test containers Node, test containers .NET. So if you have colleagues who are doing other languages, less fortunate people, uh, that's a joke, we love all languages. Uh, you can go and tell to them that, oh, I was at the SpyCon conference and I learned this amazing thing and maybe you should look into it because it might make your life easier. And they will be like, oh, thank you so much. Maybe you should send you to other conferences. How about like PyCon Europe or something? And you can go to cool places. Right, anyway. Enough of that. Test containers Python, what it does, it integrates with Docker, it runs the checks that you can run actually containers, it can like uh, mount the networks, it can copy files to containers, so it does like a bunch of checks to prevent you from running tests in the environment when you actually cannot run those things and then fail because something is wrong, so it tries to be nice uh, and kind of predict the errors. It also does extensive cleanup, so all, it, it removes everything after the tests are done, uh, well, for some definitions of uh, removes everything and done, but mostly all, all of the time it removes that. And it also tries to mimic and uh, encourage the best practices for your integration tests. It tries to randomize everything that can be randomizable so there are no conflicts. If you want to run two open search containers and expose the same ports from the containers, you cannot map it, for example, in the same host port because with two you will get the conflict because there is only one port of value like X uh, on your host machine. So the ports are randomized, there are data, to, there is an API to randomize and initialize data nicely, and it tries to give you the right levels of isolation so you can parallelize the test if you, if you prefer faster execution times in UCI, for example, and so on. So there are best practices and it's universally pretty, pretty interesting. Test containers Python comes with the ecosystem of modules. Right? So there is an API to run containers, and you can run whatever that runs in the Docker container. 
but the, also other people have contributed things that can tell you, oh, if you want to run Neo4j, which is a graph database in your, in your uh, Docker container, you might not know how to run it. How many of you know how to run Kafka in the container, in the Docker container? Kafka is a message broker. Andrew knows, right? It's, it's, it's not easy. I don't know how to run Kafka. Uh, in the, I kind of sort of know where to peek because there is a test containers module for Kafka and I can look at that and kind of copy that, but it's non-trivial. Uh, but somebody else did that for me. So I can just say like, give me my Kafka or give me my uh, RabbitMQ or give me my local stack and I will get an instance of that running in a Docker container and I will naturally just have no idea what exactly was needed to run that. I can just use it. As an application developer for writing my tests, this is the best thing ever because I don't need to learn more unnecessary stuff, which will make me more productive in the long run. But you can also run everything yourself and it's just a, a little abstraction there that you can just run. So let's look at the code. Let's try to write a few tests. Let's try to learn the basic building blocks of the API and give the, get the look and feel how it works. And just uh, if you want to see the examples or other languages, go on GitHub. As I said, there are plenty of uh, implementations. Mm, they are all community contributed, right? So it's not, it's not us being like, oh, Python developers need test containers, so here you are, test containers for you. No, somebody came and was like, oh, there is such a great idea for test containers. Let me create test containers Python. I know there is one person on Twitter right now. He, he creates test containers PHP, and he kind of sort of documents his journey which is very fascinating to look at. Uh, but I don't know how useful that is in, in general yet. But it, it's, it's, it's very cool. Uh, you, you, if you want to contribute to some open source project and you don't know where to contribute yet and you don't feel confident enough to just go and play with the, like, I don't know, like mess something up in Django, then <laughs> come mess something up in Task containers Python. <laughs> We'd be happy to uh, have all contributions. Right, so let's, let's look at the code. Let's look at the code. Uh, let's look at the code. For some reason, escape doesn't work, so I'll do this manually. Let's look at the code. Here's my, I have, I have my PyCharm here, I have my ID, and I will, I already have installed the module, so I have the test containers there and everything. And I'll just try to just give you a little bit of taste of the API. So I thought what containers I can run, what images I can run, and then I figured out that there is no better thing to follow up the previous session than to run OpenSearch, right? OpenSearch comes with the proper uh, official Docker images on Docker Hub, so we can do what we can do. We can say Docker container, and we can say what? Open, do you know the, the, the tag and the name for that? No? Uh, right, I'm gonna, I think it's open search project, search project, uh, and then open search project, uh, open search, and then 220. I think this is the latest, right? And I can do open search, and here's my wonderful, wonderful abstraction, which is the container. The, this is the Python thing that represents the container that they can run, and they can do cool things with it, right? I can say open search. What I can do with it? I can, I can start it. Can I start it? Open search. I can start it. I can stop it. So there are life cycle, uh, life cycle configuration things. I can configure everything that uh, you can do with the Docker container. So I can just map volumes or I can override the commands that I want to run in the thing. I can expose the ports. I think we're going to expose the port. We need to expose the port because open search, we're going to access that through uh, uh, through the thing, right? So uh, the exposed port we need to expose is 5200, 5200. And I also need to configure open search uh, for run in this single server mode, I think. Um, so I can do that. So discovery, 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 uh, what is it? Discovery type, right? Type equals single node, right? And that's it. So this is my fully configured open search container. And if I do open search start, I think if I run this, it should work, right? It started the container. It did something. You don't know what it did, but it did something. So 
and it started the container, and it works. I can show you. Let me show you. We do, we're gonna do what? How do I do time sleep? Time sleep. We're gonna sleep for five seconds here. Ah, that's unfortunate. Uh, wait. Docker. Docker PS. Oh no, there is nothing, interesting. So we did stop it, very good, very good. I thought it wouldn't stop it, right? Uh, let's see, let's try it again. I'm gonna do Docker stats here. So this is my Docker, there is nothing running there. I'm gonna run this again. And you can see there's a container running. You don't know what it is, but it is open search container, which is pretty amazing, right? And I can, so now I can have the life cycle. And I will need a bunch of other things for this to be usable because I, I, need, I need some configuration there. Uh, and I will just, uh, just do like this, right? Because I don't want to type it on one by one. So here's a few things that we need to know. One is to access open source, we need a certain URL, right? Because it's a, it's a like web service, we need like some sort of URL to hit the queries. We can build it. And since our abstraction there uh, allows us to get the Docker-related information, we can just say well, our URL will be get the host of this container, get the port that we exposed, 9,900, right? This is the URL where we can access my open search. And then well, I also have the flexibility to say how to wait for my containers to start and what does it mean for the service in the container to be ready. For the database, it's not just like, oh, the container is started. It's actually when the database is like ready enough to serve queries. So there is flexibility to do that. For open source, we can do that in one line of literally a few lines of code. We can just say like, if you have this URL for open search where our open search is running, ping the security health and until it gives you 200, the container is not ready. Well, the container might have been ready already, but the open search within the container is not ready, which is, which is great. So with those 10 lines of code, now we can have a fully functional open search container that we can run in our tests. So something like imagine this is, will be your test and you can be like, oh, with open search, here's our URL. We're gonna feed that URL to our open search client and then our application can do whatever it needs to do with the open search. So now if I just run this, right? Then it will do something. It will tell me where my open search is. I don't think I can open it with HTTP or like that. Uh, and then it sleeps a little bit and it, uh, it does nothing, right? So this is the basic blocks. You want to have lifecycle and you have configuration to make it actually usable, which is great. Now, the second part that you want to see probably is how it will work in actual real world tests. And I got you covered. I have this uh, very simple, small example application with fast API. How many of you actually are working on the sort of like services that run somewhere and other people can access? Uh, how many of you work in game dev? Okay, one. How, what else do you do? Shout. Infrastructure engineer, DevOps people. Students, right, all of them. I'm very good at this. Um, what is, uh, machine learning, data, data science, yay. Very good. Right, so a bunch of people. Uh, it's of course applicable, it's a generic concept, right? It's not, it's, it's not something specific, but uh, well, for the test, for the example, I picked the fast API uh, sample application because, well, I know Andrew will be here and I didn't want to show my Django skills. <laughs> Uh, like at all, <laughs> no, not to shame myself. Right, so we have a very small application. It's a simple application. It's literally the uh, fast API, API tutorial. What it does, it just allows you to save users uh, with emails uh, into the database and pull the users from the database. I can run this application. I think I can run this application in my local development setting. It will use SQLite as the local database uh, I could spin up a test container based uh, actual database that I would like to use in production. Uh, for example, Postgres here, uh, because the API, there is nothing test specific in the API, right? It's just the API, so the sky's the limit what you can imagine. You can just literally put it into your application and then whoever needs to access your application and contribute, they can just clone your application and run it. And it will 
bring up the environment by itself, which is magic. Uh, but I didn't do that here for simplicity, right? I can run this application. Can I run this application? How do I run this application? I will, no, no debug. Okay, yeah, I can debug, wait. Uh, terminal, wait, six, seven, eight. All right, one, two, three, four, five, six. Terminal, oh, it's F12. Right, I can do the, 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 the running of the application. And I can just show you that here, if we go to the docs, we get the swagger, it's all good, it's perfect. So we can read the users, let's try it out, execute the query. Uh, we get two users in the SQLite database because the file persists, so I'm already there, and the user with email string is there, which is perfect, and we can also, we can create users, right? So we can just say, try it out, and this is all normal thing, like let's do PyCon at PyCon EE, and the password will be so cool, execute. Uh, so you can see that we created that. So it's a fully functional application and it stores that in the database there, I can run this. Now, I don't want to run this uh, locally like this. I would like, it just, like it does the same thing. So it gets the database URL, it creates the SQL Alchemy uh, objects out of that and then it does every, wires everything together. So in my tests, what I need to do I need to do those three things that we talked about. I need to create my database, well, actual database. In our case, that will be MySQL. I need to create that database for myself and manage its lifecycle. I need to configure it somehow, and then I need to configure the application to know where my database is running, right? So it will not go by default into the SQLite uh, file, but it will go to my actual MySQL thing there. Which is, which is great. And I do this normally. I had the tests. Uh, I have the high level functional tests that will create my fast API thing and then we'll just do the HTTP queries to it. So literally posting the new user and then getting the users and getting the particular user by ID and verifying that the data that we post and get are actually what we want. High level functional test. If this works with MySQL, then I would, I'm pretty sure the same thing would work in production with whatever MySQL I use in production, right? Because it literally uses the same technologies. So how do I create those necessary components to wire it up? Well, I just create my MySQL container and I will use the PyTest fixture there. So, and literally because the MySQL module is available, I can just say, give me MySQL. And it will use the latest tag, which you can overwrite. Don't use latest because it's a moving target. Your test will break. Uh, not encouraged, but use a, a pinned version of that. But you can create MySQL, and then in the app, we will say that when you create the engine and the, the, the well, connection to the database in the app, please just use our database container and get the URL connection from there rather than do whatever you want in the application. And then when say like overwrite whatever, get database creation in the app. Uh, and at the end of that, we just clear all that. So we can sort of, in an isolated manner, say that our app will run with this particular database configuration, which is a MySQL container, right? So I think I can run this now. I think you can run this now. It will run, and then it will, who thinks it will pass? Who thinks it will fail? Many people. I think it's supposed to pass. So it waits a little bit for the database to be ready and then it passes. It's green and it's perfect, right? So in a true fashion, never trust a test that you haven't seen fail. We're gonna, we're gonna change the, uh, the thing there. We're gonna rerun this thing uh, and we're gonna see how it fails, whether it fails. Now it should fail because now we are literally changing the uh, expectation of what the data should be there. Uh, and we have the container, I think we have the container. Do we have the container? Docker stats, not anymore. Okay, the, fa the test failed, right? So it failed and it failed with the particular thing that we expected that there is the discrepancy in our data. Let's run it again and let's look at the container. Here's my happy Tereshkova container, which is the, uh, one of the first astronauts, right? Which is, it's a coincidence. Docker gives random names to things, and you can override that. 
here in the container, when I create that, I think I can do this, right? My SQL with name, I can, I can say like sad Tereshkova. I wonder if this will work. Right, let's see, let's see. Sad Tereshkova, yes. So you see that it's not a trick, right? It's actually running things in my Docker uh, and the things that I run in my Docker actually configured by my code which is spectacular because you don't need to know anything about Docker. You just like sort of need to have it because all you need to do for doing complex things here, you need to type your dot in your IDE, which you, you literally do for a living all day long. I do as well, all right? And then you have everything that you can do. You can configure environment, you can, you can get the, the ports, you can get logs if you want to find the logs and like find whether something happened in there. You can execute commands in the container, already started container. So you can like run debug statements or you can copy the files from the container in case your tests fail, for example, and you want to state, save the state of the database or whatever, you can copy files out of the container using the programmatic API. And because it's, it's programmatic API, you can do whatever you want. Like it gives you freedom, but it also encourages you to write tests, which is two great things altogether. Right, so our tests pass fairly fast. Uh, of course, it might seem as an overkill for this one individual test, but it does run like four HTTP queries on that one, and then it, it needs to wait for the application to start and wire. So you might want to maybe like balance the level of isolation, how many containers you start in your test suite, with the sort of how config like how reusable those containers are. So maybe put all the nice tests in one group. Uh, and run with the stable containers, but then the tests that where you expect they will mess up your database or something, you can just say like, oh, you guys are running with the separate databases because you are nasty. Um, and then it will work. So you have the capacity to do whatever you want with that. Right, so, and there is more, there is like, you can compl create complex topologies, you can create like uh, chaos, uh, engineering practices was introducing Toxiproxy and then saying like, oh, cut the connection to the database or introduce latency and you have the, late, the waiting strategies and you can create images on the fly and you can do, and there is no YAML, which is a win in my book. Uh, and it, it also, you can have better integrations with frameworks. So for Django, for example, there is a, a project called Django run test with test containers thing where you can just install the driver and that is very limited, it only runs with Postgres, but it just literally, you can just say like, oh, here's my test runner, and you get the real Postgres, and Django will be configured with that Postgres instance automatically. So for your in-house things, you can literally do the same uh, if you want, or you can contribute that to the upstream projects, because that would be very cool, that's how open source works. Uh, but the thing is, you can build any complex abstractions of, on, on top of that, so it's very good. Right. The, the thing is, right, we are almost out of time here. Um, very often, there are different problems, and there are difficult problems, and there are also like sort of hello worlds of difficult problems. And very often, uh, solutions replace complex problems with equally complex solutions, which is not great, because you don't get the, the you don't lower the complexity. Or you, you, you have tools that kind of sort of e solve easy problems with equally easy solutions, which is also, it's kind of sort of great that it has there, uh, but it's not, it's not that beneficial. So I, I feel that test containers sort of hits a nice spot where the easy thing, easy things, like if I want to run my Django with, a, with a Postgres, with a real Postgres or a real MySQL, those things are easy. You literally can do that in one or two lines of code or configuration, and then, but it also have, the flexibility to go uh, as complex as you want. So it's, an, it's, an, it's a nice balance, it's a nice balance. Uh, if you don't have Docker, well, you need to have access to a compatible Docker environment. Uh, test containers libraries do work with the Docker API to manage the containers, to do the cleanup, to configure the networks and everything, so any compatible Docker environment will work. We run, uh, back last year, we run tests on uh, the Java project, uh, with various Docker environment providers. Um, and obviously Docker Desktop worked uh, beautifully as a reference implementation, but also the, the older way of running Docker on Mac and Windows, like Docker Machine, which is still open source project, which is sort of deprecated, but it's still functional and works. That worked as well. 
Uh, Minikube is the local Kubernetes, um, which is, exposes Docker API. Not all Kubernetes do Docker API, Minikube does, um, and it worked beautifully as well. So as long as there is a compatible implementation, it will work. Uh, we at Atomic Jar are building sort of the serverless cloud backend for the test containers based tests where you can run your tests locally, but the containers are started in the cloud in a serverless fashion. Uh, it's in the private beta, so you cannot get it yet. Uh, but if you are super excited about that, then you can, we can talk, definitely. Um, but yeah, any Docker environment will work. And if you want to learn more or start applying that or contribute, I don't know, if you have a favorite technology that you would like to uh, make it easy to test Python application against that real things, then maybe contribute a module to Task Enterprise Python. Right, so the docs are there, the open source is there. There is a Slack channel which you can join because if you want to ask questions and hang out with the like-minded individuals, uh, then you can join that as well. And uh, that's all for me. Uh, so thank you very much. Uh, let's write better software. Uh, yes, we have only a few minutes before the first keynotes. Uh, but no, before lunch. Uh, no, first keynote next. I thought it was lunch. No, I was. If, so if you really want, you can <laughs> no, no. get some more I was snacks. so confident that it's lunch. Uh, okay. Laser focused on things. Yes. Um, so we have some questions here. Um, one is one you are showing this list of the test container repositories. The Java one was very active, but the Python one really wasn't. Is this because it's more stable or just not very used? The, so the Java version of test containers is very popular in the Java ecosystem, right? It integrates with the, we, by default, with the most popular application frameworks in the Java ecosystem. Uh, it, all, Java is also community sort of heavy on the enterprise apps where everything needs a database and a bunch of services to, to run anything. So, and it all started with test containers Java. So it is more popular. It's also functionally a little bit more advanced in some ways, uh, and we would get to sort of the parity uh, functionally wise between different implementations uh, when we at Atomic Jar have more, a little bit more capacity for engineering. But uh, you're welcome to join. It's like all of the projects are very friendly. Uh, we from our side will provide you with all the information that you might need for uh, like sort of test containers and integration test specific things. Uh, I, well, you would need the Python knowledge because we, we are not Python developers mostly, but uh, we would love to help. And uh, you could be the change that you want to see in the world. Mm -hmm. And then the graph will be there like, yes. yes. Just make lots of pull requests of reformatting and <laughs> adding some comment spaces. <laughs> uh, no, no don't do that. That's, <laughs> that's what Hacktoberfest is and that is bad. Like, do proper pull requests, do things, issues first. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, contributions welcome, and we'd be happy to have any. Right, uh, another quick question here is, uh, how are you experience using this inside of Docker, this Docker in Docker? Yes, you can run it with Docker in Docker. You, because we need Docker API, you need to expose the socket, and you sort of, it can run with the remote host. So currently, I was running with the test containers cloud thing, so those Docker things, the containers were not run locally. Uh, but they were run in the cloud, and it does, you just need to provide the configuration where your Docker daemon runs, uh, and ensure that that has enough privileges to sort of kill the containers if necessary, uh, but it does run in, in, in Docker and Docker CI, uh, and I think it's even in the readme, there are some basic instructions what you can uh, get to get it work. And I'm sure if we ask in the Slack, Reddit Slack, people will be yeah, More yeah. than eager to help solve any yeah. problems. All right, I think we have time for one final question. Is uh, nice pants? Where did you buy them? Where can we get them? Oh my God! It was a present. It was a present. Uh, I also have a hoodie like that. Um, but uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.